Hey Brewtubers, happy Homebrew Wednesday. Um, so I'm filming this late at night, Wednesday night. Hope everything in the video comes out okay. Um, but what I have in this, my stone glass, which I usually use for tasting gravity samples, as you've seen, and a little bit of my ESB. And now over the past, let's say, almost 24 hours or so, maybe a little less, gone on kind of a wild ride with this beer. So on Monday night, Actually, so it's more than 24 hours. So on Monday night, um, I saw what I thought was a little signs of infection, like a few bubbles that you would see, like on a, in the beginning of a pellicle from Brett, or, a, you know, or in PDO, but especially known for Brett, which has been exposed to oxygen. And I'm like, okay, I'll take a sample, see what it tastes, and see if it's really an infection. So I took a taste, you know, I saw that sadly the gravity hadn't gone below 1020, 1021 after raising the temperature back up. Um, and you know, I didn't taste infected, so you know, I put it back in the chamber, sanitized like usual, and uh, then this Wednesday morning, um, I uh, I opened it and I shined the, my, my flashlight app on the top, and I saw that there was a full pellicle there with, with same size bubbles, but just a film over the top with the same, you know, with more bubbles. So what I did was I quickly crashed the beer down from let's say where it was in about the low 60s, mid to low 60s, all the way down to 50 degrees. So I just set it on my STC 1000 controller, let it gradually bring it down over, you know, while I was at work. Um, so then I went to Bitter and Esters and I went over the issues with John, one of the owners who I've become close with over the past few years. And um, so we devised that instead of using my normal auto siphon, I would use just a piece of tubing with a, with a plastic racking cane. So, and what I mean, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So, um, so what I ended up using was my normal auto siphon. I don't know how much this is going to show up on camera, but you know what an auto siphon looks like and then what I was trying to use was this was a a racking cane like a normal racking cane that you would buy that's plastic and not from from a uh, an actual auto siphon and then a piece of tubing with a bigger clip on it that I already had um, I had the clip I didn't have the tubing so the I was able to get a siphon started but it just kept failing on me and I tried to but you know sucking the beer through sucking star sand through and just what I'm not you know well versed or well practiced enough in making a siphon that way so after I after I got about a little more than half the beer in the keg with all that struggling and re-sanitizing the tubing and all that I said you know it's already really late at night I have to go to work tomorrow let me just say okay I'll give my auto siphon which I've had for a while to Sours um, and then I'll buy a new brand new one um, with new tubing um, when I'm ready to keg my next beer um, so which I'll talk about in a second um, so a lot of updates this week I didn't think there would be but after this infection um, I did take a picture of it with my phone but didn't, I don't think it really did justice but I'll show you it anyway um, but I was able to using the auto siphon get down all the way down to the yeast cake pretty much and get pretty much all the beer that I was able to get excluding the stuff I lost to trying to get the siphon going I was able to get that all in the keg and now it's you know carbonating with my usual schedule at 30 psi um, for a few days before I start put it down to the serving pressure um, so um, so I'll pour myself a little bit of Founders Porter, which is one of the one of the bottles that didn't end up going into the Franken beer. Uh, so I'll just pour a little bit. I might not drink the whole bottle because it's really late, um, but I just wanted to have a beer to chat with because I have a bunch of other things to talk about. So this beer actually, um, which has a, almost like eight or nine months on it, and that is still smelling pretty good.
Yeah, so I'm glad I'm, I only put one bottle in the Mishka bottle, Franken beer. It's still pretty good. And I have one more bottle from this batch beyond this one. So last night, some of you who are friends with me on Facebook know I went to my go-to beer bar, which I've mentioned many times, Blind Tiger Ale House in the West Village of Manhattan. Um, and they were having their 20th anniversary celebration. So they, what they did smartly, which I really commend them for, is that, you know, like, as a beer geek, you want to try as many beers as possible, especially the hard-to-find ones. But for this celebration, they really wanted as many uh, people who have been long-time patrons of the Tiger to come and enjoy a time there instead of just beer geeks running to catch the rare beers that they had on tap. So I'll post a picture uh, that I took of one of the chalkboards with the tap list. So they didn't post the, the beer list till around 5.30 or 6 o'clock so that you know, the people who saw it later and were willing to change their plans or their plans were strengthened uh, to go to the party by the tap list they would come and those people like like I said would be people who are interested in not only a beer but hanging out with the staff at the Tiger at the Blind Tiger uh, to celebrate this monumentous event so I did a quick podcast interview with Dave Broderick the, the co-founder and owner uh, which I'll post um, as a separate podcast episode and maybe I'll do what I've done in the past and put like pictures over the audio so you can have you know, if you want to see a montage of pictures with the audio, you can't. So, but I'm not, yeah, again, I'm not sure I'm going to do both. There's the podcast on the, my blog and that. But I'll let you know. So, um, what I'll do is I have, I'm, going, I'm here in my untapped. I don't know how well that came out. Uh, but I'll talk about the beers that I had. Um, so, I had a bunch of beers that I've never had before. Um, a bunch of beers that I've wanted to try. Um, so first we'll go with the first two beers, um, uh, which are both from Health Farmstead from Vermont, a very famous brewery, very hyped brewery. So I had their Legitimacy IPA. I don't know which hops are in it, what's so special about it, but everyone was hemming and hawing uh, about it when I got there. So that was the first beer I ordered and it was really good, like true New England, really juicy. Really nice background, dankness, smooth body, really drinkable. Um, so I really enjoyed that to start. Then um, what happened was there was a uh, there was a Lost in Finest Liquids IPA. I forget its name right now. If I can find it, I'll post it here um, on tap. But by the time I wanted to try it, it had kicked. So and then they put on a Lost in Coffee Imperial Stout. But I wanted to ease myself into the higher ABV beer a little bit. Um, in the end, I really went back and forth, which you'll see. So I have been wanting to try the Pilf Armstead Everett Porter uh, for a very long time. And I haven't tried, hadn't tried it yet. So I got a small glass of that. Um, and for the limited beer, sometimes, especially if they don't have a bigger, like a half barrel keg, They'll serve it in smaller 8 or 10 ounce glasses. So I got one of those of the Everett Porter. And it lived up to his expectations. Um, just as good as my go-to Porter, Founders Porter. And um, it landed in the spectrum of like a mixture of like the chocolatiness of the Great Lakes Edmund Fitzgerald with the robustness of, and the, the roastiness of the Founders Porter. So really great balanced beer and I would love to try it again. Especially as like a full pint with food. Uh, maybe if I can get a growler of it sometime, that'd be awesome. Then, from a brewery that I hadn't heard before, but a fellow home brewer who was there recommended from a Florida brewery called Jay Wakefield, I tried their Berliner Weiss called Stush, S T U S H. Um, it was really nice. The lactic tartness was really in your face more than any other. More than other Berliner Weisses I've tried. It reminded me actually of my Sour Saison, but it wasn't overly tart like mine was, but it still had that full on lactic flavor, which is really nice. And then I went to the Faston Maple Imperial Stout, which I'm pretty sure is the right one. 
um, because there was only one on Untapped, but it was a Coffee Imperial Stout from Hill Farmstead, and I really liked it. Really nice coffee flavor, a nice smooth dark chocolate body uh, behind it. And then I had from from Crooked Stave and another low ABV beer, um, the Saint Breda, which they do different citrus fruits throughout the year. So I had the Clementine. Now for first most of the little small glass I got. It didn't really have much clementine, but as it warmed up, like the second, the last few ounces, it definitely tasted like fresh clementine, so that was really good. And then, not to hem on, on more about craft beer, because this is Homebrew Wednesday, I had a little, to end the night, because um, I was there for quite a while, I had a taste, a small taster, um, of the Lagunitas High Westified Imperial Coffee Stout. Um, and I wish I had, you know, you know, I wish I had gotten a full glass of that instead of getting another glass of the, um, of the Hill Farmstead IPA, but I wasn't really in the mood for another, at the time I wasn't in the mood for a 12% beer, so, so I just got a taste and it was, it blew me away. Definitely the best Lagunitas beer I've ever tried. Really, you could really taste the barrel, the vanilla, the coconut. The chocolate from the Imperial Stout, a little bit of roastiness in the finish, really smooth beer, um, and it definitely was uh, overall just an awesome experience. And uh, that was probably my last time at the Tiger before the baby's born, but it was good to get a last hurrah. And I did actually skip my homebrew club meeting tonight, Wednesday night, because I had gone out drinking the night before, and I knew I needed to keg the ESB right away. Um, so. Luckily, I forgot to mention um, uh, the last little bit that's in here. As you see the color, I don't know if you can see the color. It's a nice golden color, um, and it, the infection because I caught it almost right away, and I took care of it before it got really proliferated and really ruined the beer. Um, it still sm didn't affect the taste, and now that it's on CO2, um, and I purged the keg of multiple times. Um, so that you know, so that I, I wouldn't the infection wouldn't spread it within the keg. Um, I might have to change my O-rings in the end, but um, because I took care of it, um, it doesn't really smell or taste um, like the whatever infection was in there affected the overall taste and aroma of the beer. There's no real funk. There's no nothing. It's a nice honey taste. Nice breadiness. A little sweet because it finished high, but overall, I'm really looking forward to having it on tap. A nice English bready character to really, really pair well with food as we transition into from the winter months into the spring. So it should be really good as long as the infection doesn't take hold in the keg. It should be really good. So, um, so for my last update, um, my next beer, which I'm hopefully going to be brewing this weekend. Um, I want to have a low ABV stout on tap um, to replace the brown ale, the coffee brown ale that's on tap. Um, it's just because my wife likes stouts and stouts tend to age well, especially to keep them cold in a keg. So I want to make the last beer I brew a beer that my wife can sample if possible because there's a lot of controversy around drinking alcohol while breastfeeding. But I want her to be able to sample it here and there. So if I wanted her to be able to sample it because she likes stouts, I'd uh, keep it really low ABV so it'll be drinkable for me and she can sample it if she decides to do so. So um, what I did was I took my breakfast stout, which is basically an oatmeal stout base, and I tweaked it a little bit. I added a little bit of roasted barley, um, added more oats, took out the lactose, took out the cocoa nibs, and I changed the yeast to the Y yeast 1084 Irish Ale yeast so it have a nice dryness but with the creaminess of the oats and the Victory Malt which is a melanoidin malt which I put up to the amount of that too to really accent the readiness of the oats um, so it should come out to about 1050, 1051 ended up, be ended up being like a 5% stout um, which should be really nice so I'll try my best to uh, film as much of brew day as possible for that one um, and that'll be my, my will definitely be my last brew day because you know if I'm brewing it on March 18th 
and the baby's due a month later, I'm not going to really have time in April um, after kegging that beer in two or two and a half weeks, or two, two and a half weeks after, I'm not going to have any time or to really desire to, to take time to brew again. So for my last beer, you know, I want to test out a recipe that I could brew um, and maybe even have a year-round stout recipe. Uh, it's low ABV, but really flavorful, really creamy, and really enjoyable. So um, I'll try to edit this down a little bit. But I can't make any guarantees since I talked a lot about the ESV, the Blind Tiger and now what's coming up. So um, I haven't devised a plan of how I'm going to post while I'm on my brewing hiatus. There's definitely going to be a nice big hiatus around the birth, obviously. Um, but I'll be posting updates on Facebook. So if you're friends with me on Facebook or you follow the Brood Palette, then you'll see stuff there. But... Um, but I'm, I haven't figured that out. Maybe I'll do some more beer mails uh, just so I can make my homebrew Wednesdays about homebrew reviews from brew tubers. Um, but other than that, um, that's what's going on. So I wish you cheers. Happy homebrew Wednesday. Even though, again, I'm not posting this on a Wednesday and keep on brewing great beer.